start my talk now about this uh, statistic language modeling and uh, how is it related to artificial intelligence. Uh, I think it's like very exciting uh, problem because like uh, today everybody's talking about uh, artificial intelligence and the progress in neural networks and how we are getting close to some singularity and AGI and uh, topics like that. While well, if you actually uh, see, at least from my point of view, if you think of building some some great classifiers of images, I don't really see that as like a way how to build AGI. It's more like a system that can recognize images and uh, do things like that. But uh, I always did believe that if we are to build uh, like real artificial intelligence, like a computer, or some machine that will be able to, to think like uh, humans do or solve similar problems as we can solve uh, uh, in a similar way. Uh, I mean, uh, kind of like artificial human. Uh, then I think that the language actually has to be part of the solution because uh, otherwise it will be uh, very weird to have a system that is uh, super intelligent but uh, unable to communicate with us. So I think that uh, that uh, nature language processing itself is like very, very important for AI research. Uh, and then in particular, language modeling can be seen as a, as a very cool sub-problem of NLP that is actually AI complete, which uh, many scientists did observe uh, in the past. Uh, well, that's the first thing that I would like to argue in my talk uh, by giving some examples of what uh, people before me did think about it, uh, starting with Shannon and, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, then I will describe like uh, quickly what is the state of the art today with, uh, with language modeling and uh, why I think that we are successful compared to what uh, did exist maybe some 10 years ago. Uh, but at the same time, I will also like, uh, I believe that we didn't solve all the problems yet and that there are still like uh, new discoveries that have to be made and that can be like uh, very interesting and important at the same time. Uh, so I'll try to motivate uh, some of you to think of uh, language modeling as unsolved problem uh, there, there are still like uh, interesting challenges. Uh, uh, maybe we need to develop some new mechanisms how to train these models or like think of uh, different architectures of, uh, of the underlying models. Uh, it's, uh, it's not clear what the future will bring, but I'm convinced that, uh, that uh, we still need to, uh, to do some research here and just more data is not gonna solve uh, everything for us. Uh, and then I will of course like speculate about what can be the next models after uh, the neural networks that, uh, that are today used uh, quite a lot. Uh, and there will be about uh, complex systems and uh, some models where complexity emerges uh, spontaneously on its own and how this could be possibly connected to language modeling. So, so that's a quick overview of this talk. Uh, uh, the fact that uh, AI, uh, like uh, that language modeling is AI complete uh, has been, uh, has been uh, like uh, observed or at least argued uh, for by many people in the past. I did uh, just uh, put here some big names. Uh, uh, for example, Claude Shannon who did come with information theory that uh, spent uh, like quite a bit of time by working on entropy of, uh, of English. Uh, and it was like very insightful work. If you would look at this old paper, you would find some character-based uh, Ingram models, uh, which, uh, which were uh, seen as kind of like simple statistical models uh, at its time, but uh, somehow it became like super hard to beat uh, the Ingram statistics uh, in language modeling for like many, many decades. Uh, so I would say that up to maybe 2010, the Ingrams were still like a absolutely dominant technique in the, in the scientific literature when it comes to language modeling on, on uh, some uh, significantly large uh, data sets, non-toy non data sets, I would say. Uh, then there was Ray Solomonov, uh, who had spent all his work working on uh, concepts uh, similar to minimum description length. In this case, it was uh, algorithmic probability, which can be seen as generalization, actually, of minimum description length. Uh, so uh, so uh, Ray Solomonov uh, did believe that we could build some scientific uh, uh, or scientist's uh, assistant uh, by building, uh, building basically these models that can capture all kind of, all kind of regularities in sequential data and then maybe uh, continue, uh, which could be used uh, to continue, for example, generation of, uh, of text and so on, kind of the things that we see to, uh, today are that are being done with language models. Uh, even more concretely, uh, these ideas were, were described by, by Marcus Hutter and Matt Mahoney in their Hutter Prize, which was a competition that actually motivated me quite a bit to think about language modeling. Uh, was published around 2006 and the goal was to compress as well as possible some 100 million uh, characters from Wikipedia where the idea is that uh, the more you can compress the data, the more regularities the data compression algorithm has to find and uh, the better it will be at uh, modeling the language, uh, which kind of, I would say, um, 
makes uh, science, especially if you consider what is the state of the art uh, uh, at, at this other price today, and it's basically like a combination of uh, engrams and uh, some recurrent neural network uh, language models. So, in fact, it can be shown, and I have uh, some short chap chapter about it in my PhD thesis, that uh, language modeling and uh, data compression are basically the, the same problem. Uh, if you really care about data compression uh, accuracy, actually, if you care about uh, about uh, speed, then it's uh, then it's different because uh, many data compression uh, algorithms actually sacrifice accuracy for for speed, and then it's actually a different problem. Problem, of course. Uh, so for uh, so for some concrete examples, how it could look like, it, we would have actually some really like smart uh, language model that kind of see uh, a lot of regularities in the. In the data, I would say not all of them because that's not really computable in the same sense as minimum description length. It's not computable. So let's just say that we would have a model that can uh, that can discover in sequential data in the language uh, similar patterns as humans can. Uh, then we can actually build uh, right away uh, like question answering systems. So for example, you can uh, continue um, like uh, uh, generating text um, like uh, in kind of like question answering style. Uh, as I said this example, like the capital city of Czech is, and then you con continue writing the text using uh, using your your smart language model, and should give you uh, the highest uh, probability word uh, in this context should be Prague uh, or a movie I would really like to see is, and then you already see that this is uh, getting more like contextual, and the model should have some sort of memory to know who is uh, speaking now and uh, what movies uh, uh, does this person like. Uh, so uh, it's it's not as easy as the as the first uh, first example, and even more more complex examples are shown below. Like uh, you can uh, you can think of generating a continuation of uh, of some text uh, that would be like uh, uh, like uh, what would uh, some uh, amazing uh, scientist uh, do if he would try to invent some new approaches to language modeling and so on. So that's uh, that's the kind of kind of like science fiction things. Uh, uh, at the moment, uh, because we don't really have uh, such powerful language models, but uh, surprisingly, in many cases, even the models that uh, today exist uh, can uh, can generate uh, plausible continuations of uh, of uh, like uh, complex sentences. So, so again, like uh, if we would have uh, these uh, these really good language models, then we can think of building some intelligent chatbots, uh, which would be basically like a uh, a system that would continue generating the most likely uh, like continuation of a conversation, or like some science, or sort of like scientist assistant, which can be seen as a chatbot that would be trained on some high quality science science data. Uh, so that uh, that is all kind of like dreams at the moment, but I think that we are much closer to these dreams than than again like a decade ago, where just thinking of these applications using Kangaroo technology would just uh, sound totally nuts, but. Uh, but uh, with, uh, with uh, the state of the art of language modeling today, with uh, neural networks that are trained on like uh, hundreds of billions of words, uh, uh, that's actually uh, like uh, closer to reality than, than it was before. Here's actually some example that uh, I did find somewhere on Twitter. There are actually somebody that tried this experiment with, uh, with some really like big language model. I don't remember but it was uh, some open AI language model, I guess, uh, maybe the GPT-2 or 3, some of these. Uh, these big, uh, big language models that are somewhat available to, to, to the public. Uh, and actually the red uh, text is what uh, the user did type and then the black uh, continuation has been written by the computer. So I will not really uh, read all of it, but uh, you can basically see that if you just uh, start some, uh, some fictional story about the conversation between, uh, between Alan Turing and Claude Shannon, which actually never happened, uh, but, uh, but you just continue generating the text, it actually makes uh, some, somewhat sense and it's like a really really good compared to what uh, would be the continuation of the text uh, if you would use as a language model seven gram model so it's it's actually looking uh, like that we are maybe making progress here <clears throat> so of course the, the question is like uh, uh, what uh, what is the core of, uh, of this success why we are so much better than that uh, decade ago as I said like with Ingram models this would not be possible at all in the the context would just uh, get deleted after a couple of words, and this uh, this continuation of the conversation would uh, actually never really happen there. Uh, so I would say that uh, the main idea in neural language modeling is really uh, simple, and it's about clustering similar histories. Uh, uh, and so if you know the board to back example, which is showing that uh, distributed representations are like uh, quite powerful to uh, like extract a lot of knowledge uh, when it comes to 
uh, when it comes to uh, individual words, then neural language models are doing uh, kind of the same thing, just not for words, but uh, for whole contexts. Uh, uh, so it's kind of like clustering uh, similar contexts. Uh, uh, just quickly, engrams, I think everybody knows uh, these techniques and uh, they are like historically known for their inability to model longer context and work classes. Again, I would say that uh, it was uh, it was quite uh, quite interesting in the history. It, uh, it uh, turned out that many, many scientists that believe that it should be easy to beat the uh, engram statistics uh, because it just seems so so simple, but uh, it took uh, took like uh, many decades of research, as I said, like it was uh, not obvious uh, to know what can uh, what can beat engrams until it actually became reality. Just uh, just uh, some quick reminder, maybe some of you know this uh, this very insightful technical report from uh, Joshua Goodman, which was uh, about this bit of progress in language modeling. And basically the conclusion was here that uh, the more data you use, the harder it is to beat the engram, uh, engram models. Actually, if you would uh, see as a baseline model, the uh, five gram with Nezerne smoothing, then you can actually see that uh, the gap between a combination of all techniques that Joshua did use and between five grams is actually getting much, much smaller, the more data you use. Uh, so that was quite uh, quite a disappointing result uh, at the time, and it was believed uh, uh, that uh, by I would say maybe 98 percent of people in the in the research community that uh, if you will uh, be having uh, large amounts of data, then working on uh, on uh, language modeling research is going to be useless because uh, everything's going to get beaten by the engrams. And the language modeling research makes only sense if you have small amounts of data. That was the Concluding back in the days. So today we know that it was wrong, but I'm just giving this, that example to, to show that even when the scientific community believes uh, uh, in something uh, like very strongly, it, uh, it doesn't uh, mean that uh, it will be uh, the same forever. Uh, so just just quick uh, quick uh, idea why why engrams are not a perfect solution. Uh, as, as I was uh, saying, uh, Claude Shannon was doing these experiments uh, in the 50s where he was uh, like trying to estimate the entropy of English, and uh, it was getting clear that uh, uh, that engrams uh, are not learning uh, from the data as quickly as humans do. In fact, you can train engram model like as, as guys uh, at Google uh, did maybe some 15 years ago, uh, when they did publish actually engram statistics from some insanely huge amounts of data. It was still much worse than than the perplexity that uh, that a human would assign to to some English text. So. Uh, this is kind of like an illustration. If you would think of neural networks, they would be somewhere between. They learn faster than the engrams, uh, but uh, stay, uh, still they learn slower than, than the humans. So, so again, like that's why I would argue that uh, neural networks are not there yet, and there is still more to discover. Uh, so now the question is like, uh, uh, how can we go beyond engrams? As I said, like neural networks are great uh, at clustering words and. Uh, uh, just just uh, to quickly go over these uh, historical papers, uh, I was uh, doing my PhD at the speech, uh, speech group at the Bernal University of Technology that was actually doing deep learning because before even the name was invented. Uh, now there was, for example, Peter Schwartz who was uh, using uh, neural nets uh, to model uh, phonemes, uh, to, to build a phoneme recognizer. And he was using like even like these skip connections that are later reinvented in the in the computer vision community with a lot of fame. Uh, there was also like uh, Francesca Grezel who was uh, who was applying uh, uh, the deep neural networks to LVCSR systems, even in some competitions organized by NIST, uh, while having like huge improvements in the water rate. So there was a lot of like uh, famous results even before 2010 that uh, are a little bit forgotten today, but. Uh, just to show that uh, there are often like uh, cool ideas uh, that uh, just are underexplored uh, at their time. So I think that we can think even of the present that maybe there are some cool ideas that already do exist today, but uh, are not really used. Uh, there just quickly, I was using myself these recurrent neural networks, which are also like a concern by the research community to be not trainable. So when I had, uh, had these results on the pantry bank, uh, which was like almost 50% reduction of uh, Perplexity. Then I actually did uh, face a lot of disbelief uh, from the scientific community because uh, somehow people did, uh, didn't didn't really believe that it's possible to be engrams uh, this much, and even with the recurrent neural networks that uh, were supposed to not really work. Uh, but then it really happened, and uh, uh, there was this revolution in language modeling with neural networks. Uh, that's all like history. Uh, 
I did plot here the best results that I could find over the years uh, on the pantry bank data set. Uh, so you can see that the perplexed improvements were all, already kind of like uh, stagnating uh, before 2010. <clears throat> but then with the interaction of neural networks, it was, uh, it was getting uh, much better for a while. And then there was, uh, again, like this, uh, this plateau, which uh, I did find funny because after, after things uh, uh, started to work, there was suddenly like this huge switch uh, to neural networks, but uh, somehow the improvements became more like incremental. So I think that we still need to wait for another revolution for other approaches that will beat, uh, beat the neural networks this time, the same way as engrams were beaten before. Uh, just a uh, just few more results. Uh, this is um, the opposite of what Joshua Goodman did find. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bigger for my thesis, uh, where actually I did find that uh, the more data you use, the uh, uh, bigger improvement you get over engrams by using neural networks. So there was uh, it was very optimistic, and uh, and that it find it very cool, and it was uh, it was uh, it was also like important to keep the neural networks to grow in size, to increase the size of the hidden layer, and this is uh, an example. Sorry, uh, this is an example uh, where uh, where neural networks uh, with increasingly large uh, size of the hidden layer were trained on some really strong uh, system from IBM with 400 million training words. Uh, in 2011, it was supposed to be like a they're like a, a large uh, system, and uh, you can see that the word array uh, did, uh, did continue uh, dropping as the, as the size of the neural network uh, was being increased. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of promise in neural networks. Uh, already these results were like much better than the, than the baseline, and there was still more to be gained by simply training bigger neural networks. And that was actually my conclusion of my PhD thesis in 2012, that. Uh, uh, that for the future we, we need to focus on making the neural networks uh, larger and train them on more data and exactly that's what has been happening in the last years so uh, with all these uh, all these uh, big language models uh, that are being published uh, these days by all kind of startups and companies so so just uh, just to uh, have this uh, have this conclusion for at least from my point of view the key concept is really like the clustering and distributed representations that's uh, that's what works uh, in neural networks, uh, also like uh, from my point of view, I did like that uh, neural networks are general so that you can model any kind of uh, temporal signal using uh, say recurrent neural networks. Uh, you can use even the uh, language models, uh, language modeling techniques uh, uh, based on neural networks uh, today on different languages than English uh, without uh, having to change pretty much anything, uh, at least for most of the languages. Uh, you can use it even like for other signals that uh, have nothing to do with language and uh, uh, like often it will work somewhat. Uh, so that's uh, that's also like what was my belief that language uh, is uh, it's like so general that it's uh, very similar to like many other temporal sequences that we can observe uh, in the world. Uh, uh, also like to make some conclusion about like this uh, this uh, historical introduction uh, the morals uh, of the story for me was that uh, what was important to make this bridge between language modeling was to uh, allow these results to be easily uh, reproduced by other scientists uh, so I did uh, believe that uh, open sourcing the code is very important and uh, there was at a time where it was not standard at all and uh, also like to publish the data sets on which we are running the experiments uh, Again, when I was a PhD student, I did spend a lot of time actually just by looking for some data sets uh, that I could use. And uh, the only really good uh, open source code for language modeling was, uh, was SRILM a toolkit, which I used actually for many years. So, so I think that uh, that's uh, already what improved uh, and uh, we should be doing this more like uh, uh, allowing others to reproduce our experiments more easily. Then uh, I also had the feeling that uh, the research community was more like a binary. Like uh, for some time, uh, I felt uh, almost like nobody believed uh, in these neural language models that uh, that uh, the results must, must be some mistake or that uh, there's some mistake in the data sets. I did hear a lot of these stories uh, uh, or like opinions in the beginning, but then somehow it all switched and suddenly uh, people started saying that neural networks are going to solve everything. And uh, we are again like finished. We don't need to invent uh, anything new and just neural networks are going to do everything, but I think that's actually a wrong conclusion. I think that uh, the right conclusion should be because we don't know what uh, what will work in the future. Uh, we should just uh, like work on uh, new ideas. Uh, 
like if the whole research community will keep working on a single in, in the same direction, then I think that uh, by anything the novelty of the research, we are actually missing a lot. So I would say we, we don't even need to compare all the techniques on exactly the same data sets. I think it would be nice if the research community would allow some existence of, uh, of competing ideas uh, to be developed in parallel. And I think that would be actually uh, like uh, that would allow the research progress to be much uh, richer and uh, possibly even much faster. Uh, so now like uh, to, uh, to uh, my speculations about uh, what can be the future, I did spend quite a bit of time by analyzing what is actually difficult to learn for the neural language models. Uh, uh, as I was uh, showing that graph before where I was claiming that, uh, that engrams do learn much slower uh, from the data than humans. Uh, and that neural networks are some, somewhere between. And of course, like we can be wondering what, what are uh, the kind of relationships uh, that neural networks uh, cannot learn. That's a lot of, like difficult to specify because if you have infinite amount of data, then even engrams can actually learn everything, which uh, which uh, was actually a lot like uh, uh, claimed by, by Claude Shannon in the 1950s. Uh, so if you would talk about neural networks that are even more powerful than engrams, then of course, like if we think of these uh, 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 arguments about uh, what will happen if we have like uh, infinite amounts of data, then then of course they will be perfect. But uh, uh, the question is uh, what uh, what can people learn from a limited amount of data that neural networks cannot learn? I would say that uh, uh, some nice examples are related to memory. Like uh, the concept of memory sounds uh, kind of simple to us, uh, but once you start thinking of it, it's uh, actually quite close to the intelligence. For example, if you hear some Chinese sentence that you don't speak uh, Chinese, then you will not really remember much of the information. Maybe you will remember the sounds, but you will uh, forget it uh, later. But if you actually know the language, if you hear the same sentence, but in English, uh, then uh, it can be much easier for you to remember what was said because you actually understand English and then uh, you can uh, create these, uh, these structures in your brain and so on that it will keep, uh, keep this memory uh, for a long time. So I would say that uh, uh, the understanding and the formation of the memory are quite related. So intelligence and memory are quite a bit more related than it seems at the first, uh, first sight. Uh, so I would uh, argue that uh, memory is one of the things that we can think of uh, if uh, we want to study these uh, deficiencies of uh, neural language models. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of like uh, higher concepts that are being introduced uh, um, again, like over the last years. So, in the research community and many many topics that are related to all these uh, all these uh, difficulties uh, of learning, uh, which would be like transfer learning, incremental learning, compositional le learning, and lifelong learning, continuum learning. There's a lot of like uh, these different names. I believe that uh, we may actually make progress in all these areas uh, if we are lucky and find some new ideas that will allow the models, for example, to uh, form some more stable memory structures. Uh, then I think it would be suddenly much easier to do, uh, for example, the compositional learning where actually I would say the long-term memory is kind of like prerequisite. Uh, so I'd say that even if it seems that there's a lot of uh, unsolved problems at the moment, uh, many of them are related. And if we make progress on the basic uh, mathematical models, we can actually improve quite a bit. Uh, so just, just some fun example, if you would actually continue generating the text that I was showing before from that Twitter example, then you can see that uh, even the bigger, biggest neural language models today are not perfect. They will just uh, so somehow like uh, um, drift from the original conversation in some, in some direction because uh, somehow Shannon said something about magic and then suddenly there's, uh, there's Harry Potter char characters uh, arguing about some magical things. Uh, because uh, there's not really like any any reasoning or any any sense uh, any goal that the language models would have when they are generating the text, uh, they don't even have good representation of the memory. As I was saying, uh, they are more like faking it a bit. Uh, uh, there's always some hard limit. Uh, so uh, so I think that uh, that's uh, one way how we can think of making progress to focus on something that uh, that people can do and uh, uh, or some other models can do but neural networks cannot. Uh, so as for the memory, I will have uh, here the example with, uh, with uh, stacks, uh, where we actually used a special recurrent neural network architecture, where actually uh, the recurrence is through stack structures, uh, which allow um, to uh, 
have uh, memory with uh, with um, like a variable length, uh, kind of like expanding type of memory, because stack uh, has this ability to always like add one more element uh, on top of it, uh, on top of the memory structure. And then if we could actually build models of this type, then uh, we should be able to solve some problems that require require you to have a variable length memory. And uh, we actually did find that uh, this indeed uh, possible. It was not that easy, but we we could actually. Uh, like uh, beat uh, some of the best regard to network architectures using these uh, special stack elements uh, on problems that are like, like uh, uh, very much a uh, test uh, memorization ability. Uh, so you can have like a sequence memorization, for example, where you have one sequence repeated twice, uh, and then the model should uh, should uh, be able to like. Uh, uh, like uh, produce the second uh, sequence or predict the symbols in the se second sequence with a uh, very high probability if it actually uh, understands what memorization is and has this uh, uh, expanding type of memory. And uh, that's indeed what we did find that uh, the stick RNNs actually did, uh, did find uh, mechanisms how to add uh, symbols uh, on the stack uh, so they could solve problems that are much longer uh, in length uh, uh, during testing than what they are trained on. So the models did generalize outside of the distribution from the train data, while um, long short term memory recurrent neural networks uh, and normal RNNs did not actually generalize to longer sequences. So, so it's more like a proof of concept that there actually do exist uh, really like some mathematical models that can learn more patterns uh, from the data than uh, than just uh, uh, than uh, than just a uh, normal typical neural network. So. Uh, at the same time, I wouldn't really say that the uh, stake RNNs are like very practical form of long-term memory, because if you think of it, if the, the long-term memory would, for example, uh, store all the information from Wikipedia, then if you would want to access something uh, in the middle of uh, Wikipedia, you would have to cycle one step at a time through this wall structure. So the time complexity would not be constant, but would be linear with the size of the memory, which, uh, which uh, does not seem to be uh, practical at all. Uh, the same way as common computers are more like uh, random access memory based and not uh, not uh, like during machines. So, so again, like it was more like a proof of concept that there does exist something uh, that is better than normal neural networks, but uh, but we should be searching for more like uh, um, more like uh, practical types of uh, of uh, some neural networks with uh, long term memory. <clears throat> also, like. Uh, Sometimes I feel that people are overestimating the abilities of the language models today. Like uh, if you have a computer that just produces some uh, some text that uh, looks very smart, it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that it's the computer saying the thing, but it can be just repeating uh, sentences from the training set uh, where actually the training data comes from text that was written by the human. So if you just have a like a language model that produces a sentence, I am an intelligent computer, that doesn't uh, mean that we did uh, Create some uh, some conscious being and so on, which I think that uh, is often like a misrepresentation in in the media nowadays, uh, where we have like also like a, like a big beliefs in a, in a language modeling that are not uh, not uh, based on some real facts. So I think that uh, uh, we should be like uh, optimistic, but at the same time not overselling the achievements uh, so far. Uh, now, like uh, what what could be from my point of view, like one interesting direction, and there should be many more di directions. I don't want again, like uh, to claim that there are just one thing to work on. So, for just from my point of view, uh, interesting direction for the future can be to think of uh, models that are actually uh, which are uh, able to somehow organize themselves. Uh, uh, I don't even want to say learn, but basically somehow evolve over time so that they can actually. Uh, capture some statistics, for example, from the input signal, uh, but mostly like unsupervisedly. Uh, and uh, the area that uh, is studying such a, like a spontaneous emergence of interesting structures, uh, sometimes called complex systems, uh, um, where actually a complex system is basically some, uh, some system where non-trivial patterns uh, uh, emerge uh, by applying some function again and again. It's kind of like a uh, similar to recurrent neural networks, actually, again, that uh, that you can have some model where you just keep iterating over time, and uh, then somehow uh, in some of these uh, uh, like uh, dynamical systems, some complexity emerges, and uh, 
I believe that uh, language actually can be seen as a complex system. And from that point of view, having actually some mathematical version of complex systems can be like a very good uh, model for, for describing the language. Uh, and that's not exactly uh, done with, uh, uh, with uh, artificial neural networks because the typical artificial neural networks are not uh, complex in this sense because uh, even if you have like some really nice uh, recurrent uh, language model, then uh, you know, by trying to retrain it on the text that it uh, is generating, uh, will uh, will basically just degrade the performance. It's not uh, uh, possible to uh, to have a kind of like a language model that would start writing more and more complex books and uh, increase in complexity over time. That's basically not uh, not uh, like uh, something uh, that can be done with the with the current models. Uh, but if you would change somehow the mathematical models, uh, uh, like uh, that, uh, that describe the language, uh, so switch from neural networks to something uh, else, then this uh, this may be possible. So what is uh, what is the complexity? We can see it uh, like all around ourselves that, that there's uh, a lot of complex structures, but uh, which arise uh, from uh, some interactive application of uh, uh, some simple function on many many elements, and even like the whole universe. Uh, can be seen as a, as a complex system. Uh, and uh, if we actually want to achieve this uh, general artificial intelligence or strong artificial intelligence, the thing that I was introducing the talk with, uh, then actually having a system that can uh, continuously evolve uh, uh, without requiring any supervision may be actually uh, necessary to, uh, to, get, uh, to get to this point. Uh, uh, it's also like a, something to know that uh, this uh, this complexity is something that has been studied by many scientists, including uh, a lot of famous physicists who did start uh, some of the big ideas in this field. Uh, like it has been studied for decades, but uh, there are still like some basic unsolved problems, like uh, even like what is the mathematical formulation of complexity? Like uh, how can we measure it? Uh, if you have like these three pictures, uh, which one is the most complex? Uh, uh, well, intuitively we would say the, the one on the right because it. Uh, seems that it's uh, having the most patterns and it's uh, it's looking interesting also the most colors uh, but uh, but somehow if you start thinking of uh, concepts like minimum description length and so on you can actually find that uh, many of these complex looking patterns uh, are generated or generated from short computer programs and so they don't really have uh, much uh, much complexity from this point of view so uh, i'd say that uh, uh, i will just go quickly over these complexity metrics like homograph complexity is, is a nice uh, idea, but uh, it's not very applicable in this context. Uh, similarly, with, uh, with information theoretic approach, uh, we can be trying to measure information to complex systems, but, uh, but then there are some deterministic systems uh, like Game of Life, for example, uh, that seem to be getting more complex over time, but uh, the amount of information is already fully, fully specified in the starting system and the transition table of the system. So it uh, actually is not increasing uh, the amount of information. So it's also like a, not very intuitive. And there, there was a lot of other uh, other like metrics that were studied. I will just uh, say quickly that there is this uh, uh, nice book written about uh, these complexity metrics, uh, the Quark and the Jagger from, from Mari Gelman. Uh, so if you are interested uh, in, uh, in, uh, in these topics, then, and then you can read it. But again, it's not really like solved uh, uh, yet. Uh, uh, so uh, like one of the systems that uh, is very simple and that has been studied a lot by, the, by this community uh, is, is a model of uh, solar automata, which is kind of like a parallel system, parallel computer, where you have a tape where the computation is performed on every position. Uh, like uh, just by looking at the neighborhood of, of, uh, of a cell and uh, its own state, you, ju you compute the next state. So uh, the time is uh, time axis here is uh, is the y axis going from top to uh, top uh, to down, and then on the on the x axis there's the theta state. And you can see that just from some very simple starting state, you can start observing uh, uh, like patterns that don't really seem very predictable. They can be looking chaotic, or they can look somewhat uh, somewhat structured. It has been studied by by Stephen Wolfram, 
uh, he did come up with these uh, with these classifications that uh, the systems can be behaving in a quite boring, regular way, or in very chaotic way that is uh, where you don't really see anything uh, uh, like uh, happening in the same sense as uh, in white noise. There's just uh, no structure, and then there are some systems in the middle where actually things seem to be kind of evolving over time, and that's that's the complex systems here. It's shown on the on the bottom left uh, figure. That's the as the complex uh, category of the Sora Automata. Also, like many of you may know about uh, the game of life, which is like another example, just uh, now uh, in 2D. So it's like a two-dimensional Sora Automaton, where again, like you can start at simple patterns in the beginning, and if you run the system for long enough, it can generate a lot of uh, complex things. In fact, it has been proven to be Turing complete, so if you, so there basically exists uh, some starting state that can simulate pretty much any computer algorithm. Uh, well, we did actually try to work in this direction by uh, by uh, looking at uh, systems with, uh, for example, more states. If you sample the transition table at random, you will pretty much always end up with a behavior like this, just basically uh, noisy behavior, very chaotic. Uh, if you maximize the conversion length, there will be exactly this uh, type of behavior that you find. So this information theoretic approach uh, doesn't really doesn't really seem to be a very good. Uh, uh, but uh, in this paper that we uh, published two years ago, uh, we did use neural network to predict uh, the middle state uh, um, given its uh, neighborhood, and uh, and this uh, this uh, uh, is uh, is used to come up with a complexity metric uh, that is kind of like uh, similar to compression, but we want the compression to be also like stable over time. So if we train it on, uh, on uh, the state of the system uh, in some particular state and evaluate it in some distant future, it sh should still work. So the patterns should be stable over time. And this was our complexity metric, kind of like compression based, but uh, the compression should work on distant future times as well. And uh, the details are described in that paper that uh, is called evolving structures in complex systems. And here are just examples of the of the systems that have the highest complexity from this point of view, like given our metric. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot of uh, systems where you have like gliders, uh, kind of like uh, structures like in Game of Life that are spontaneously emerging. Just the cool fact is that uh, we could find many uh, systems with uh, different behaviors automatically, unlike Game of Life, which was designed by hand by a human. This actually is, uh, is uh, these systems are designed uh, like uh, algorithmically by sampling a lot of uh, systems and then picking the ones with uh, the highest growth of complexity over time. There was also like different, more mathematical approach where we wanted to find systems that are actually, um, we believe that, uh, uh, that if the transients, uh, which is the, which is the uh, amount of time that it needs uh, for a system to, uh, to enter a loop, uh, we see them as a computer. They always have to start looping at some point if they are if these uh, solar automata are discrete uh, and with uh, finite uh, size. Then uh, we wanted to find some systems uh, that will be behaving uh, uh, in a complex way based on the way how quickly the transients uh, grow with the size of these uh, automata. So again, like details are in this paper, uh, classification of complex systems uh, based on transients. Uh, but just show, to show quickly, it very nicely corresponds to Wolfram's classification, uh, but, uh, but it's totally completely based on, on, the, on basically math. Uh, so it's not handmade. In Wolfram's case, it was, uh, it was manual labeling of the systems, which, uh, which one is uh, which category, but in our case, we could do it algor algorithmically. So here's the first category, which is uh, kind of like boring. The second one is, uh, is growing super slowly, so it's just like boring. The third one was the complex one, and then the fourth one was the was the exponential one, which is uh, which is the chaotic one. And uh, here are just some examples to quickly show, uh, because I think I will be running out of time in two minutes. Uh, so uh, just uh, the like uh, multi-state uh, 2D systems that we could find by looking for for automata where the, their transients uh, grow linearly or, or polynomially with the size of the automaton, uh, we could find these, uh, these diverse behaviors. And uh, uh, that's kind of like, you can think of it uh, trying to uh, create some kind of like artificial universe that keeps evolving over time. And again, like uh, uh, to explain how this is related to the language modeling that I was talking about before, if we want to have a uh, memory structure that can like kind of like spontaneously emerge uh, over time, 
in the mathematical models, then I'd say that uh, it would be nice to have mathematical models that really like do support this emergence. Uh, if you would use typical regard to neural language model, then it will, it will actually behave uh, uh, kind of like that chaotic system that I was showing, more like the white noise there. It doesn't seem to be any emergence of, uh, of things that would be stable over time. Well, in the case of these slower automata, uh, there already is uh, emergence of structures. And interestingly, it can be shown that uh, these slower automata are actually, uh, can be uh, like uh, described as a special uh, neural network architecture, which is uh, both convolutional and recurrent. Uh, in this case, also like uh, discrete in the state, uh, in the states, uh, but uh, there can be some hybrid uh, ideas about having uh, conti uh, continuous uh, slower automata with continuous states. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, if we can design some, maybe some special type of neural networks that uh, do support the emergence of patterns that would be uh, not supervised, but would be uh, would be spontaneous uh, or unsupervised, I, I can say, then that, that can be a beginning of a system that actually can uh, evolve to have uh, some sort of memory that does not have to be programmed uh, manually, as it was, uh, for example, the case uh, of the stacks. Uh, and uh, again, like once we have these uh, evolving structures, uh, we can either try to train systems to do something in a supervised way, like I mean, something useful, or maybe uh, try to influence the evolution that is undergoing in these, in these comp complex systems so that we can start solving some tasks. So of course, there are some uh, future steps that we are working on currently with, uh, with a small research group that, that I have at, uh, at the Czech Technical University here in Prague. Uh, and uh, that's basically the, the conclusion of my talk. Uh, we want to advance in language modeling and general AI. We, we may want to uh, develop some, uh, some models that, uh, that can spontaneously and unsupervisedly increase in complexity, kind of like uh, how evolution created the human brains. Uh, it was also unsupervised. Uh, so I think that we should have uh, similar models uh, in, uh, that uh, can also like model uh, the language in this way. So thanks for the attention, and I don't know if we have uh, still a couple of uh, uh, minutes for the questions. Okay, so thanks a lot uh, to Tomáš for his uh, uh, great talk. Um, so we have already three questions in the um, in the chat, so I will start there, and then I will uh, switch to to oral questions. I, I see Dieter with uh, with raised hand. Uh, so the first question we have from Ricardo Del Grata is, do you think as a complex system, language is deeply nonlinear? Uh, well, uh, deeply nonlinear. I would say that uh, it may be if you, especially if you start thinking of, uh, of some of some uh, of these uh, long-term memory problems. Uh, uh, if you look at uh, like current uh, neural language models as they do exist today, I would say that uh, the nonlinearity is quite important there, but uh, but uh, it's not not like a deeply nonlinear. I'd say that it's helping us uh, a bit. Uh, it's an important bit, but uh, currently the nonlinearity is not as as helpful as it may be in the future. Like a uh, these zero automata, for example, when I was uh, showing these examples, that can be seen as actually as very nonlinear systems because they have the discrete states. Uh, but uh, then again, the current language models are quite linear actually in the way they behave. So I'd say the current uh, state of the art in language modeling is more linear than it may be in the future. OK, thank you. So is uh, anyone uh, from the audience now uh, in, uh, a direct uh, question? Well, if not, then we have another question in, in the chat from uh, Jan Odijk. Um, and, and it says that, um, uh, that concerns your remark on the on the long term memory in the Chinese example, uh, and and Ian says that someone who knows Chinese can form structures which enable so called chunking, which avoids overflow of the short term memory. And for someone who does not speak Chinese, will have short term memory overflow. So is this a relevant example for the for the long term memory? Uh, well, sure. If you if you hear a, a long sentence, then uh, then uh, this uh, this uh, this chunking can can help you quite a bit. But even if you hear something short, uh, you will not really pay attention much to it if you if you don't really understand it. So if you even if you would hear a couple of Chinese words, uh, you will probably not even try to remember it. Uh, even like unconsciously, it will be not uh, that important. Of course, if you would really try to remember it, you you can do it. Uh, 
even if you don't understand the language. But uh, but my argument was more about like that uh, the intelligence and memory are uh, closely connected because you remember much more uh, the things that you understand. Uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot under that you cannot remember things that you don't understand. But uh, but uh, in general, you remember much more easily and much more things that you understand. So we form our memory uh, in, in some hierarchical way. It's not just uh, some uh, some naive copy of the input data, kind of like the sensory signals that you would be storing on some hard drive in your brain, but uh, the memory is much more high level in a sense that it uh, allows you to, uh, to understand and remember complex concepts, which uh, if you don't really have the complex concepts, then, then also uh, your memory will be will be limited. So that's why I was making the argument that uh, in my view, intelligence and memory are quite related. If you are not intelligent, then your memory will be of different type than if you actually are intelligent. Okay, thanks. So we have one question from the audience. So Dominic, uh, please, uh, if, if you can unmute. Uh, sorry, I'm just, I, I hope you can hear me all right. I'm, I'm unfortunately, I have to be on my, on my phone. So I, I I really like the last slide, the idea of the models kind of continuing to evolve. To, the, but the one thing that the current models don't have at all is an, any ability to do hypothesis, to reflect on, to kind of determine, have a reflection on the rules they're using to sort of to be able to say, I have said this because I'm following certain steps or stuff like that. That's sort of the sort of thing you need, for example, when you when you dis, you know, like this sort of a like garden path sentence, you're disambiguating that sort of thing. So do you think? That sort of approach would actually get to a model that would that would be uh, able to do something like that, or would you need to have a different approach to that? You know, some sort of a more more of a heuristic, traditional sort of decision tree kind of kind of approach. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's uh, similar also like to these uh, chatbot arguments. Like uh, like if you want to build a build a nice chatbot, then you also also would want the model to be able to explain, for example, why it believes something and. Uh, uh, then you can correct it when it actually says something wrong. You can say, okay, you did believe that uh, your answer should be this uh, because of that and that, but uh, this your assumption was wrong. So next time, don't say uh, so don't don't say this answer. Uh, so of course that would be nice. Uh, it's it's hard to say that neural networks cannot do it because if you specify the problem well enough, then of course you can kind of like fake it with supervision so that uh, you can train it on example so that it will appear that it's actually doing it, but uh, but not, not really. Uh, that will be not really the case. So I think that uh, uh, that it is related also like to what I was saying with these complex systems. Like uh, we can have models that can have this um, like uh, memory of uh, or the knowledge of the language stored more in this long term memory. Um, then that can be actually like emerging and can be updated. Uh, there will be kind of different type of memory or like representation of the language than is the current uh, way. If you have neural network, where actually all the all the knowledge of the language is stored in the, in the white matrices. Uh, then it's often like a hard. Uh, you know, for example, episodic memory. It's uh, it's very hard to find out uh, uh, something that happened, for example, like one million training words uh, back in time, and uh, like keep some fragment of say or some story, and uh, be able to to kind of like record it. Uh, we as humans can remember what we were doing on the holidays five years ago. It's not a problem for us, but. Uh, the way how the memory is currently represented with uh, neural networks uh, that doesn't really allow this episodic memory. So uh, I think all, all these concepts are actually unfortunately quite related. And again, like uh, uh, my belief is that if we can develop some new generation of the mathematical models that uh, do represent the language uh, and uh, of course the, uh, the memory structures that, uh, that capture the language, uh, then we can, we can be making progress here. Otherwise, uh, we may be just putting ourselves to just increase the amount of the training data uh, indefinitely. Then, of course, like uh, it may appear that we are doing something new, but uh, but uh, we may be just failing uh, in the same way like forever. Okay, thanks. So, so, so I'm afraid we have uh, time for one short question. So, Edhard, you have put uh, your question into the chat, but can you maybe summarize it very briefly to to have Tomas still chance to answer your question? Yeah, it sort of follows on the uh, previous question. Uh, I mean, it's been a number of people, Victor Vapnik has been one of them, uh, who is saying we need to go beyond classification with, uh, you know, deep learning or even other types of machine learning models. And what I'm wondering is whether you consider this part of your uh, ideas about complexity, or do you think this is a whole different area of investigation that needs to be followed? 
Yeah, I think it's actually very related. I also like uh, believe that the classification is uh, is uh, often like uh, overrated because uh, if you have a problem, a problem that can be specified so well that you can see it as a classification problem. Of course, it can be a very useful problem to solve. Uh, no, no problem with that. But uh, I think that we are often like uh, overstating the abilities of the models that do this classification. Like uh, you can think of say sentiment analysis being uh, a classification problem and you can build some artificial system that reaches 95% uh, accuracy. Does it mean that it uh, resolved the problem like okay or that it understands the language? Or is it more like that, uh, okay, there are some shell statistics that our classifier understands, but it knows nothing about the language. It doesn't have any memory. It doesn't have any reasoning. It, it doesn't really like understand anything uh, beyond just isolated single words uh, without even context. And it can just uh, work quite well because there's uh, there's the same distribution of the, of the data between uh, like in the training and best sets. Uh, so I think that, uh, yes, I would uh, certainly see that uh, going beyond classification should be uh, like big, uh, big focus for the research community like uh, uh like already like going for example in a uh, in the direction of generalization to find models that uh, can learn more patterns from less data or generalize to out of the distribution data uh, is sort of like interesting but it can still be seen as more like continuation or extension of the classification paradigm but there could be also like a uh, different uh, different approaches to to uh, say uh, even like in the NLP community, like uh, if we would uh, say what is our final goal, like uh, what would be the perfect system that we can buy uh, and that we can build, and I'd say maybe some computer that can actually uh, use language in the same way as a human. And then the question would be, can we see uh, this as a big classifier or should the objective function for us uh, be uh, something more than that? I would argue that uh, it should be more than that, uh, but it's not that easy to actually come up with, uh, with uh, some it's some concrete proposal it should look like. I actually did write uh, some paper about uh, these ideas uh, in like 2015, maybe or 16. I don't remember exactly. It was called a roadmap to machine intelligence. It was uh, I was arguing there that it should be about language and it should be also like about this uh, ability to use language and learn to use language uh, uh, in some in some simulated world. Uh, which can be uh, in the future replaced by by the real one, but it was like uh, an attempt to uh, to uh, define some uh, tasks uh, that can be uh, more related to actually the real goal as I see it for for the community of people who actually want to build their, like intelligent computers that can use language and uh, there was no longer a classifier but it was more like a machine that can use language to solve some trivial tasks that uh, children would be able to solve but also like learn during uh, during solving of these tasks something new and uh, apply it to new and new tasks so it was no longer just a plain classifier but it was more like a generalization learning system that where generalization was important Okay, so thanks a lot. I think we will have to stop here. So uh, thanks again uh, to Tomas for his uh, for his great talk.